gentlemen. Uh, of course, we'll speak with Martin George. Uh, and, oh, and, of course, we will also have Mr. Anstem Richards. And we're dealing with this whole question of national security threat. Threat. You would have heard myself and Mr. Cox. But we do have Martin George and, of course, uh, one of my favorite commentators. And he's not holding back his punches on any issue. He would call it as he sees it. And that's what I like about him. Good morning, Mr. George. Yeah, hi. Good morning to you, Brother B. Good morning, Mr. Cox. And good morning to all your listeners far and wide and your viewers. They take you in in Lithuania, in Kazakhstan, in Sweden, in, you know, all over the world. This yes. program is the number one morning show. Well, and I you. congratulate you all on the good work you're doing. And thank you, Mr. George. And coming from you, we, we take that with great uh, pride and and seriousness. All right, let's get into it. The Prime Minister made a pronouncement, Mr. George. I mean, and I use the parlance that if tiger or if crocodile come out of water and say, he have tiger down, they believe him. Now, I'm going to the serious part of this. <laughs> when the Prime Minister said to the nation, there is a possible cult in the SSE that uh, can lead to overthrowing the government. And of course, we learned further that 70,000 rounds of ammunition uh, the SEC cannot account for. Putting all that together, what do you make of such a pronouncement by the Prime Minister? Well, the thing is, Brother B, what I found quite interesting is that, you know, in any normal civilized society, if you, as the head of the National Security Council, came out with this type of revelation and you did not indicate well what you did to either deal with it or stop it or to even be aware that this was going on under your watch normally people would be held accountable and that accountability goes right up to the top so you know it, it, it's interesting that the Prime Minister, who is head of the National Security Council, they have meetings all the time. They meet with the Minister of National Security. They meet with the head of SSA. They meet with all these people. And basically, you are telling the nation, you didn't know that all of this was going on right under your nose. So I think that's an important aspect of the conversation that we are not hearing about as to how was this allowed to happen under your watch without you knowing or without you being aware of it you know if it is such a dire plot that you are saying then i think that reflects a failure of the national security council and nobody seems to be addressing it from that perspective at all because in other words so you're saying basically a who could have almost happened in trinidad and tobago yet again and nobody's aware i mean where, where, where's the accountability in that regard that, that, that's what I think we should be discussing more, more than, you know, whether it is true or not. If it is that you as head of National Security Council are coming out and saying that, then of course, yes, as Prime Minister, we take your word, guaranteed, we accept what you're saying. But the bigger question is, how come you did not know about this? Where did that failure occur and who is being held accountable for that failure? So, but there's something definitely wrong with the... SSC uh, agency that provides intelligence to uh, people in uh, people like the prime minister and so on. What <laughs> there seems to be, a, I don't know, a sinister agenda by those who uh, are labeled as cult and, and other types of uh, names that have been called to label these individuals. What would what in your view is wrong with this SSC? Can it be? Can it be? <laughs> what kind of investigation to to, to see who? Uh, is culpable in misconduct, uh, Mr. George. Something is wrong. The, the, the bigger question, Brother B, is why do we need this SSE? What good and tangible results and benefits has this organization yielded for Trinidad and Tobago over the years? All we have seen publicly in relation to this organization has been one scandal after another. It's bacchanal, it's infighting, it's legal actions, it's Rishmi, you know, it, it's it, all sorts of things, you know, with directors being fired, then they turn on, they sue the state, they get millions of dollars. You know, I mean, what is the real purpose of this organization? Because apart from appearing to be a political spy tool 
which is what you know those in opposition label it to be when they are in opposition but of course when the roles are reversed and they are in government they embrace the ssa you know and they have no problem with, with it but you know the thing is it really serves little or no benefit to the general population of trinidad and tobago as far as the publicly you know um, posted results would show so the man in the street if you ask the ordinary citizen okay what is the benefit of the ssa to trinidad and tobago what what is your answer if i ask you brother b what 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 have you benefited from there being an ssa in trinidad and tobago what what what, what is the answer so you ask yourself you know because i mean it's an agency that is you know consuming hundreds of millions of taxpayers dollars and then you ask yourself what are the benefits or the tangible results so when you do that cost benefit analysis i think unless there can be some clear definite justification we have to ask ourselves why are we even continuing to have this organization um around just bubbling up you know millions and millions of taxpayers dollars mr george some persons are comparing the ssa to the likes of the cia and so on um, you can comment on that but just, let me just make this point the prime minister also is questioning the why the, the 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 unit there was a particular unit that was formed but it was not it was not approved by the cabinet the national security council or the minister of national security and he's saying that this this unit um, they would have procured high powered rifles and, and so on that that basically they weren't aware of um is the issue at the moment this secret unit or this secret procurement of assets or it's bigger than what we are hearing coming out of the the audit so far well i i think the bigger issue is really and truly how were they able to do this and how were they able to do this undetected and unnoticed by the national security council that, that 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 is my concern you know so i mean it, it's very easy to cry wolf now and say well oh they were doing this that the other but if you are head of the national security council and you all are meeting all the time and you all are you know monitoring and you know carrying out your oversight duties then how did this happen and you all were unaware of it so in other words these people could have it, it, okay, let, let's take it to its logical conclusion. If we take what the Prime Minister has said at face value, then there's a possibility that these people could have overthrown the government. And you there basically in, in, in slumberland because you were not even aware that this is happening. Hmm. And that, I think, is what we need to be discussing. How could that happen? So in other words, it, a coup could have happened again in Trinidad and Tobago. And nobody, nobody in Ministry of National Security, you know, the National Security Council, nobody, Commissioner of Police, nobody is aware of it. Come on. And who's that guarding is the guards? where we need to be asking the questions. Um, I'm using Brother Vies to me. Who's guarding the guards? Uh, because, I mean, <laughs> if Roger Best um, was removed and he was the head of the SSC at the time in March, um, and now, um, I'm, I'm sorry for Anthony Philip Spencer, um, Brigadier General. Yeah, Anthony he was Phillip brought back. Spencer, he was, he was brought, brought back in, and he was part of charge. Exactly. Um, who is the team that would support him in the investigation or has already supported him in the investigation? Who's really got any guards, Mr. George? Well, well that, that's a question because, I mean, the way the Prime Minister has teased this issue, you know, it gives the impression that, you know, there are moles and spies and infiltrators within the organization. So, you know, I mean, like, who, who, who is... Who is who inside there? Who is police and who is thief? If you understand me, you know yeah, yeah. It, it's kind of like you remember um, Bujubantan sang in his song. He say thief never like to see thief with long bag. So you know it, it's like so it, it's spy versus yeah, yeah. spy. Remember the the old cartoon, um, you know from Mad Magazine, spy versus spy. That's what it looks like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, Mr. George. Anything else on that? Because I want to go to a point that you made about uh, the presence of well, the Prime Minister holding the meeting with the Chief Secretary and others, but I just want to finish uh, before we shift to that on this whole SSC issue. Uh, lastly, what would you and want to also say? Gonna be just just as an aside, you know, the interesting conversation that yourself and Mr. Cox were having um, earlier in relation to 
the, the hairstyles. I think that's something we definitely have to speak about in depth then because I have a lot of information on that. In fact, in the USA, they have actually proclaimed what is known as the Crown Act, mm. all right, which is specifically designed to protect persons who wear natural hairstyles because mm. in a lot of workplaces, they were being discriminated against. Bosses were firing people, putting them on suspension because they came to work with either dreadlocks hair or kinky hair styles or, you know, that kind of thing. So they actually have implemented legislation and it's known as the Crown Act. Okay, all right. So, so we'll we will that. definitely have to talk about yeah. that in another right. show. But, but let's go now to our security situation here in Tobago. Clearly, four murders, uh, Mr. George, unheard of uh, in Tobago. There's guns on the street of Tobago. Uh, they are coming in, and you pointed to it. All of us are aware, the Prime Minister, also, with this nonsense that we don't have security at the ports. We do have scanners, vehicle scanners. You mentioned that you could walk through the body scanners, and you're going through as though you're going to heaven. Uh, without sin uh, at that security check. However, your vehicles can get on uh, to and from any of the port without very little or no checks at all. Um, how do we battle this issue of guns, Mr. George, that is presently taking lives into Tobago? Well, okay, so the thing is we have to assess where are they coming from, all right? And brother B, I have not heard or seen any credible or tangible information to suggest that guns are being landed in Tobago en masse at any unauthorized port of entry. So in other words, there's no little bay, you know, up in Charlottesville or Speyside or, you know, anywhere that, you know, people are coming in with loads of illegal guns. No, no, no information from the police has suggested that. So therefore, you basically have to then focus on your legal ports of entry. You have two. You have the airport, you have the seaport. The airport, actually, by and large, they have their systems and procedures in place. They are pretty well tightly locked down in that regard. So there's no evidence to suggest that the airport is a major source of the entry of illegal guns into Tobago. So then, if you look at that, then by process of elimination, it leads you to focus on only one area, which is the seaport. And that's why I keep saying, you know, it's palpably absurd that you are scanning a walk-on passenger, right? A man with a briefcase and, you know, his laptop. You're scanning him for guns, right? He has to walk through the scanner. But yet still a van load of guns could be driven on. And there are no scanners, first of all. Even the checks that the port officers do, they are usually very cursory inspections, you know, yeah, open your trunk, all right, they beep, they say, all right, okay, all right, go ahead. If you understand me, nobody's going to have that kind of thing, just open, exposed, it will be disguised, it will be hidden, it will be, yeah, if you understand me. But I guess maybe because of time constraints, because of manpower constraints, they are not able to physically conduct any detailed search of vehicles otherwise the boat will never leave on time etc and i could understand that so that's why common sense dictates that you therefore have a vehicle scanner which you basically as they drive through the same way you have a person scanner where they walk through it's the same concept you know brother b yeah. you have a vehicle scanner where as you drive through they would then be able to see right what is in the vehicle in terms of any heavy metal or so you know and then be able to make the detection and that's what is needed so i i don't understand why in the year 2024 we are behaving as if these things don't exist and we don't know about them and we don't know how to deal with it you know so therefore you know i mean unless we tackle the source because, I mean, I was quite disturbed, Brother B, when I saw the report of the woman from Valsane who was shot, um, I think, in Mount Pleasant. And they said that the attackers came out of a vehicle with assault rifles. And I'm thinking, wow, wow yeah. this is where Tobago has reached. We have persons out there with illegal guns in the form of assault rifles. I mean, you, you, you know the kind of carnage you could commit with, with, with one of those you know those are the types of rifles they use in these mass shootings in the u.s 
you know, like, you know, a disgruntled employee, he come and, you know, he's he, he fired and he comes back to work the next day and he gone down 15, 20 people. I mean, come on. Do we ever want to envisage such a scenario occurring in Tobago? Tobago is way too small. And, you know, here's the interesting point on all of this, Mr. Cox and Brother B. Do we all realize that at this point, on a per capita basis, Tobago for the year so far has a higher murder rate than Trinidad. Hmm. Let's understand that. Let that sink in for Tobagonians who want to continue to bury their heads in the sand and pretend, well, everything is okay and this is an idyllic, peaceful paradise. We want it to be an idyllic, peaceful paradise. We wish it could get back to being an idyllic, peaceful paradise, but we need to confront the reality. So we have more murders per capita in Tobago than Trinidad. So we like to point fingers and say, well, Trinidad violent. But statistically now, we are more violent than Trinidad when it comes to murders. Hmm. 